The Abolition of Man, Chapter 3, The Abolition of Man. It came burning hot into my mind, whatever he said and however he flattered, when he got me to his house, he would sell me for a slave. Bunyan. Man's conquest of nature is an expression often used to describe the progress of applied science. Man has nature whacked, said someone to a friend of mine not long ago. In their context, the words had a certain tragic beauty, for the speaker was dying of tuberculosis. No matter, he said, I know I'm one of the casualties. Of course, there are casualties on the winning as well as on the losing side, but that doesn't alter the fact that it is winning. I have chosen this story as my point of departure in order to make it clear that I do not wish to disparage all that is really beneficial in the process described as man's conquest, much less all the real devotion and self-sacrifice that has gone to make it possible. But having done so, I must proceed to analyze this conception a little more closely. In what sense is man the possessor of increasing power over nature? Let us consider three typical examples, the aeroplane, the wireless, and the contraceptive. In a civilized community in peacetime, anyone who can pay for them may use these things, but it cannot strictly be said that when he does so, he is exercising his own proper or individual power over nature. If I pay you to carry me, I am not therefore myself a strong man. Any or all of these three things I've mentioned can be withheld from some men by other men, by those who sell or those who allow the sale or those who own the sources of production or those who make the goods. What we call man's power is in reality a power possessed by some men, which they may or may not allow other men to profit by. Again, as regards the power manifested in the airplane, or the wireless, man is as much the patient or subject as the possessor, since he is the target both of bombs and for propaganda. And as regards contraceptives, there is a paradoxical negative sense in which all possible future generations are the patients or subjects of a power wielded by those already alive. By contraception simply, they are denied existence. By contraception used as a means of selective breeding, they are, without their concurring voice, made to be what one generation, for its own reasons, may choose to prefer. From this point of view, what we call men's power over nature turns out to be power exercised by some men over other men with nature as its instrument. It is, of course, a commonplace to complain that men have hitherto used badly and against their fellows the powers that science has given them. But that is not the point I'm trying to make. I'm not speaking of particular corruptions and abuses which an increase of moral virtue would cure. I am considering what the thing called man's power over nature must always and essentially be. No doubt the picture could be modified by public ownership of raw materials and factories and public control of scientific research. But unless we have a world state, this will still mean the power of one nation over others. And even within the world state or the nation, it will mean, in principle, the power of majorities over minorities and, in the concrete, of a government over the people. And all long-term exercises of powers especially in breeding, must mean the power of earlier generations over later ones. The latter point is not always sufficiently emphasized because those who write on social matters have not yet learned to imitate the physicists by always including time among the dimensions. In order to understand fully what man's power over nature and therefore the power of some men over other men really means, we must picture the race extended in time from the date of its emergence to that of its extinction. Each generation exercises power over its successors. 
and each, insofar as it modifies the environment bequeathed to it and rebels against tradition, resists and limits the power of its predecessors. This modifies the picture, which is sometimes painted by a progressive emancipation from tradition and a progressive control of natural processes, resulting in a continual increase of human power. In reality, of course, if any one age really attains, by eugenics and scientific education, the power to make its descendants what it pleases, all men who live after it are the patients of that power. They are weaker, not stronger. For though we may have put wonderful machines in their hands as we preordained how they are to use them, and if, as is almost certain, the age which has thus attained maximum power over posterity were also the age most emancipated from tradition, it would be engaged in reducing the power of its predecessors almost as drastically as that of its successors. And we must also remember that quite apart from this, the latter a generation comes, the nearer it lives to that date at which the species becomes extinct, the less power it will have in the forward direction, because its subjects will be so few. There is therefore no question of a power vested in the race as a whole, steadily growing as long as the race survives. The last men, far from being the heirs of power, will be of all men most subject to the dead hand of the great planners and conditioners and will themselves exercise least power upon the future. The real picture is that of one dominant age, let us suppose the 100th century AD which resists all previous ages most successfully and dominates all subsequent ages most irresistibly, and thus is the real master of the human species. But even within this master generation, itself an infinitesimal minority of the species, the power will be exercised by a minority smaller still. Man's conquest of nature, if the dreams of some scientific planners are realized, means the rule of a few hundreds of men over billions upon billions of men. There neither is nor can be any simple increase of power on man's side. Each new power won by man is a power over man as well. Each advance leaves him weaker as well as stronger. In every victory, besides being the general who triumphs, he is also the prisoner who follows the triumphal car. I am not yet considering whether the total result of such ambivalent victories is a good thing or a bad. I am only making clear what man's conquest of nature really means, and especially that final stage in the conquest, which perhaps is not far off. The final stage is come when man, by eugenics, by prenatal conditioning, and by an education and propaganda based on a perfect applied psychology, has obtained full control over himself. Human nature will be the last part of nature to surrender to man. The battle will then be won. We shall have taken the thread of life out of the hand of Clotho and be henceforth free to make our species whatever we wish to be. The battle will indeed be won. But who precisely will have won it? For the power of man to make himself what he pleases means, as we have seen, the power of some men to make other men what they please. In all ages, no doubt, nurture and instruction have, in some sense, attempted to exercise their power. But the situation to which we must look forward will be novel in two respects. In the first place, the power will be enormously increased. Hitherto, the plans of educationalists have achieved very little of what they attempted, and indeed, when we read them, how Plato would have every infant a bastard nursed in a bureau, and Eliot would have the boy see no men before the age of seven, and after that, no women, and how Locke wants children to have leaky shoes and no turn for poetry, we may well thank the beneficent obstinacy of real mothers, real nurses, and above all, real children for preserving the human race in such sanity as it still possesses. But the man molders of the new age will be armed with the powers of an omnicompetent state and an irresistible scientific technique. 
We shall get at last a race of conditioners who really can cut out all posterity in what shape they please. The second difference is even more important. In the older systems, both the kind of man the teachers wished to produce and their motives for producing him were prescribed by the Tao, a norm to which the teachers themselves were subject and from which they claimed no liberty to depart. They did not cut men to some pattern they had chosen. They handed on what they had received. They initiated the young neophyte into the mystery of humanity which overarched him and them alike. It was but old birds teaching young birds to fly. This will be changed. Values are now mere natural phenomena. Judgments of value are to be produced in the pupil as part of conditioning. Whatever Tao there is, it will be the product, not the motive, of education. The conditioners had been emancipated from all that. It is one more part of nature which they have conquered. The ultimate springs of human action are no longer for them something given. They have surrendered like electricity. It is the function of the conditioners to control, not to obey them. They know how to produce conscience and decide what kind of conscience they will produce. They themselves are outside and above, for we are assuming the last stage of man's struggle with nature. The final victory has been won. Human nature has been conquered, and of course, has conquered in whatever sense those words may now bear. And I think we'll pause here and we'll continue in the next video. Please like, subscribe, leave a comment below. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this book. I love you guys. As Tigger says, ta-ta for now.